testing, testing. One, two, three. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> we didn't talk about this part. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. It's been an honor to be part of Fisky. This is my first time here. Um, I'm Leslie McIntosh. I am with Digital Science. That's my disclosure. I'm a former academic who works with the library still. And yeah, and Danny invited me to speak on this as well. So thank you. And thanks, Leslie. Um, so initially the idea for this talk was that, that I speak to close off Fisky and Leslie speaks to Open Force, and we had a conversation on you know some months ago now, and it was such an interesting conversation. We actually thought it might be better just to have a conversation rather than one person go blah 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 and the next person then go blah blah blah. So that's what we're going to do. But first, Fisky wrap. So this was interesting. So both of us were course instructors. We both looked at it and said, "Oh, I'm taking yours," and she said, "Oh, I'm taking yours." And it became clear that we were approaching the same problems, questions, or similar problems and questions, but one from a very intrinsic perspective and one from an extrinsic perspective. So keep that in mind when it may look like you have two people up here who are contradicting one another or whatnot, we're coming from those perspectives. And it also shows a bit of the complexity that we are grappling with in science these days. Yep. So my talk was about oh, the course, which was run in the mornings for two hours each morning. So six hours of work together it was called the butterfly effect, understanding the big picture research ecosystem to help open practice. And we had some balloon fun. And, and this was just because <clears throat> I just threw a whole lot of things into my bag uh, and, and, and then took a photo of it and put it onto LinkedIn to say I'm ready to go. And somebody said, I hope there will be some actual balloons and uh, not actual, actual butterflies. And I thought, I, we, we can do that. Um, so we did. Now, <clears throat> pretty much everything I talk about in this course is summarised in these, sorry, my voice, <clears throat> is summarised in these two uh, sort of posts I've put up into LinkedIn. The first one is talking about the fundamental inter interconnectedness of things. And it does have a lot of the links that I talked about during the three days. And the second one is a commentary, which is related to that about the problem when one group tries to solve one aspect of the whole picture, thinking that that's going to fix everything. And, and the argument that that is only going to fix one aspect of it and you can't, you have to address everything. For, for there to be fundamental change. So that's the kind of summary. So what we did three days, day one, we looked at the depressing stuff. How bad is the situation really? Uh, the answer is bad. Um, and day two is like, how did we get to this point? Like what's been going on? And day three was a, a more positive note about what's working, some examples of, of uh, uh, things that are happening in the, in the environment and in our community to improve on uh, what's been going on. So we asked the group initially, what do we think are the major issues in research currently? And the question of integrity was obviously the largest one. Um, and then there are things like reproducibility and uh, social license and uh, things like diversity and questions around equi equity as well. Was, these were all themes that were coming through. And that's the, so this was what we saw at the beginning. So the first thing we did was we looked at a, a series of papers that talk or articles that talk about something that's happened, some, some, something bad that's happened in the in research environment. And it might be things like um, gaming the system, gift authorship, uh, uh, peer review, manipulation, et cetera. So sort of we talked about what, what, what is going on here? Who are the people involved? What's happening? And so what are the actors? What are the issues? And so we sort of did a bit of a post-it note exercise there. And then we sort of looked at in more detail, this question about is the problem people like, and so here's some examples. The one up the top is a sale of a uh, authorship on an already accepted paper. The further up the authorship list you go, the more you pay. Um, then there's also, um, I'm, I'm offering people to cite me. I'll give you some money if you cite me. So that's a good one. Um, then we've got fake peer reviews and then the question about the retractions. And of course the retractions are the ones that have actually been noticed um so that's there are a whole heap that aren't noticed so there's there's a problem 
Um, and then the effect. And so what this happens is that, that, that science itself is that, that we have the natural selection of bad science, that we end up with situations where you've got over 5,000 people on a, on a paper listed as authors. And what does that even mean in terms of if authorship is taking responsibility for the work that's published in that paper? Um, we've also got a situation where people are just going, I've had enough, I'm getting out. And so we've got a major attrition crisis in, in the research environment. So there's really big, uh, it's not just that the research that might be being published is problematic and that, you know, that might mean that somebody gets the wrong treatment or that a bridge falls down, but also in, in terms of just the community, we're losing people as a result of this. And that's a problem as well. So then we sort of thought, did the five whys question. And so five whys is you say, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why is that happening? And you keep asking why until you get to what might be the root cause. And so pretty much the root cause we ended up with, with most of them at the end was capitalism. So let's get rid of that and everything will be fine. Um, but, you know, so there's this idea about, you know, why? What is behind this? Because that takes us into um, the second day. And here in the second day, we started talking about the issues that we're starting to see, like the fact that uh, the results that just came out about analysis of the last uh, uh, five years, um, no, no, for, over a four year period, um, looking at the increase in the spend on article processing charges from uh, nine, just under a billion, 910 million in 2019, which is bad enough, like that's a lot, to two and a half, thousand, uh, two and a half billion in 2023 with six publishers. So we've got this very consolidated market and you can see the 2012 there line is because that's when the Finch report was released in the UK and that had really seismic effects on what was happening globally in the open access space. But you can see the consolidation of market and that top line is the top 20 publishers that, uh, that contain nearly over 80% of re published research. So the, the, our research is, is moving into smaller and smaller number of hands. And then we talked about uh, this, uh, this sort of consolidation uh, where the House of Brands, that's the Elsevier sort of, and that's an older one. That's, it would look different today. There's more in it. And there's, there's an example of De Groyter, which is sort of taken, sucked in a whole lot of companies over the years and just visualisations of that kind of consolidation. And then we get to that point of crap, the, the fact that graphics are useful. And when we asked people at the end, you know, what, what, what did you get out of this? That was a couple of people said, I've got, I've got out of this is that the value of a graphic, a really good graphic to explain, not lots and lots of words, use some pictures. Um, so what we tried to do after sort of looking at all of this and, and what was come, becoming clear in this second day was really discussing kind of what Dan was talking about in his plenary, where he was talking about the idea of racism is, is not one person being racist. And if we just fix that person, we solve racism, that racism is systemic. Uh, is, is, it's a sort of similar, I'm sorry if I'm really messing up what you were saying, but um, but the idea that it, it, it's kind of embedded, and uh, that, that even if the one person changes their behavior, it's still embedded. And this is the thing about the idea of the nefarious actor, that it is actually, it's not that people necessarily are being bad people, they're in a bad system. And so that was what we were sort of talking about. So let's try and map that system. Now that turned out to be really, really hard. Um, and so this was a sort of go one attempt at it. And then the second time we tried to say, you know, how, how can we kind of show how these things are all linked together? And interestingly, all the suggestions were three dimensional. So that, that we can't actually, and in fact, four dimensional because of the sort of time factor. So we, uh, we, we it's very challenging to try and do a visualization of, of this. And we also did some fun things too. There were lots of Australian suites uh, involved in this, including Minties. And the, this is a, this used to be when, you know, back in the, back in the day when I was young, um, it used to be a thing where, and there was even a competition where you could do this and post them in, uh, where you had to rip, wrap the, rip the paper and try and make the longest string out of the wrapping uh, of, the, of a minty. So we had a game at, at that. And the longest one was much longer than the rest. Okay, and then we started talking about language. And here's an example of a uh, LinkedIn conversation I had with Mark Hannell at Figshare because he'd said something, he'd put, posted something about Figshare being open, open research infrastructure. And at the time I was working for OAPEN, which is a community supported, not-for-profit, cannot be sold organization. And I said, look, just uh, splitting hairs here, uh, Figshare is commercial infrastructure that supports open research. And then we had a long conversation about what the difference is. And what we sort of came down to is that we've got 
open research infrastructure, open infrastructure, or open research infrastructure. And the problem is that there's a big difference there because talk, talking up being open research infrastructure sounds like you're, you know, the, on my side of open, you're doing the good thing. You can be as a commercial as you like and support open research. Not that's a bad thing. I'm not suggesting it's a bad thing, but there's the co-opting of the language, which we'll come on to later on. Third day, much more positive. We were talking about what's going on. What are the things that are happening? So the kind of work that's going on about push, push back against APCs and push back against transformative agreements. We need to move on. That They've had their day, time to go on. Let's move on to the next thing. We've got open infrastructure, not open research infrastructure, open infrastructure. Um, that there's this organisation called Invest in Open Infrastructure that has a sort of overview of the environment, state of play. They've got Infra Finder. So if you want to find some open infrastructure, you can go into their tool and find it. Uh, we've got a pu the pushback against research information being monetized, And also the sort of issue that Diamond Open Access is getting organised, that there's, it's a, there's actually some real structure sitting around Diamond Open Access. And we'll get back to that as well later on. And we also looked at this infographic. Um, which is a, a helpful tool for really bringing thought together about how you change behaviour. So uh, it, it gives you, a, so you might say, make it meaningful or make it social or make it goal oriented. And then it gives you some ideas there. And the group sat and talked about in their environment, what could, what, how could they manifest that? Because it's going to be different for everyone. So this is quite a useful tool for, to kind of get thinking about behaviour changes. And then at the end, we asked, what are you going to do? What's the action? Now you know all this stuff and you're full of the, you're full of the love of making things happen. Um, what are you going to do when you get back into your regular life? And so there was a, a really interesting sort of mix between I personally am going to change things in my own practice to I'm going to help the people around me understand this better or give them some tools to I'm going to start trying to fix the system. So it was a really good range of things that people were sort of thinking about what they might want to be doing as they move forward into their careers and, and, and taking this kind of knowledge forward. So that was what we did. And it was a fantastic group of people. And most of all, we made great connections and uh, really fantastic contributions from everybody. And these sorts of courses uh, are be, uh, made by the people who are in there. And we also made some dodgy <laughs> balloons. So that was, that was my course. So over to Leslie. <clears throat> Thank you for the recap. And we attended each other's classes, so we have perspectives on this. So what I'm going to do is a little bit different and just take you through what was experienced and taught in forensic scientometrics, which is the new field of the investigative science of science. So in this class, we were looking at the erosion of public trust in science, inspecting nefarious networks and resources to counter them, and countering scholarly disinformation and fostering trustworthy science. As someone told me one time, get out your tissues now, this isn't all going to be, you know, great, but we're going to go through it. So the idea is that we have a polluted information system at this point. We have opened science at the same time that technology has advanced rapidly without the scaffolds of trust and the scaffolding of how we ensure good science at the same time. And we need to be thinking about that and we have a an information river to both clean up and keep moving on. So to keep, um, to maintain. So I'm gonna take you through just an example Danny already talked about authorship for sale. I'll show you one where we looked at and I can visualize what an authorship for sale network looks like. This is actually a positive person. This is somebody with 30 years of experience, took four years of this person's publications. These are journals. And this is the co-citation network within those journals. It's pretty normal to cite one another. This is somebody with 20 years experience. So the peak of their career, this is also during 2020. And so we saw a, a little bit change in network shape during 2020 because people had papers sitting around that needed to be finished and they were. Here's our person, seven years experience, here's a postdoc. Um, two years of publication and these are all the journals that they published in. Now, this person admitted to plagiarizing the majority of the publications this person had moved on to Hong Kong University. This is public knowledge. And so we know a little bit more information about this, but there are 
editors involved in this. There are fake peer reviewers. There are citation cartels. Out of this, there's one publication that has been retracted. They leave a collaboration fingerprint as well. And it, this doesn't show up. I need to fix the background. Sorry about this. But these are citations between suspicious authors, which I should say is uh, problematic authors, um, that do not co-author with each other, but cite one another a lot. Um, without co-authoring. We all do that a bit, but this network is different. These are highlighted researchers have between 129 and 400 peer reviews in ORCID before some of them take them down after we find that out. So that's one network. That is a network of individuals working together that tend to have, that we can tell, tend to have academic credentials um, the first person who was caught has a PhD. So this is within the tent of science, if you will. Um, this one is thinking about organizational manipulation of the scholarly record. And by the way, when I use science, I use it very, you'll see, I go back to Rome all the time. So it's a very traditional definition of science. Um, here is in the Mifepristone court case, that started in Texas and that went to the Supreme Court here. We have amicus briefs in this in the US and you can cite science. You can cite scientific literature. So we looked at, well, what was the scientific literature that was cited on a Mifepristone case? And what, what you can't see necessarily, these are the organizations, but they all have one, they, they all are very much politically aligned okay, or ideologically aligned. But if you go and you look up Mifepristone in the literature and you want to do like you were doing a literature search, what would should you see? You should see these organizations being cited. So we have a way of looking at how science is being manipulated. We meaning me and my computer and a glass of wine on a Friday night, just to be clear on that. And I do have my friend Simon Porter who works. But science is and will continue to be weaponized for individuals and collective gain. The question is, what are we gonna do about it? And I think about hope in this point. And hope is very nice to say, but it really is empty if we don't have action. This is W.E.B. Du Bois. He was not in the best circumstances in this country when he was alive. And yet, what did he do? He started visualizing information to show where things were. That is hope, even if you don't get guaranteed to, to benefit from the things that you're trying to change. So one of the ways that I look at things now is, because I like art fraud, you know, movies and documentaries and think about art authentication, authentication is we think about provenance of the art first, then the properties of it, and then go to experts. If you're starting to look at, is this artwork, artwork authentic? Well, why not do that in scholarship and authenticate the same way? First look at provenance. Could it be possible that this is um, scientific scholarly work? Then if so, then look at the properties of it. And then if so, or you don't understand, go to professionals. But we actually need professionals and that's what scientific, forensic scientometrics is about. By the way, this is Rosalind Franklin's note. There was provenance for her work to show that she had been working on the hel double helix. Well, at this point it wasn't a double helix. So the argument is that yes, we could be doing individual cleanup, of what's going on in scholarship, or we could have a coordinated approach to cleanup and monitoring. And that's what we went through. And a few of the, apparently I'm a closet librarian, but I'm, you know, cause I love taxonomies, right? How do we organize trust, right? Look at the authorship, look at the transparency, look at the reproducibility. Those you can look at in individual publications. Next, let's look at how do we understand retractions and that the reasons for retractions? And that can then help us move forward and understand how science is being manipulated. Looking at the what things are just flawed research, deliberate misrepresentation, author integrity, or system level. Um, and then the last one was looking at disinformation. 
And I worked on this also with Cynthia Hudson Vitale and Will White was my other co-author. And we worked on what, how do we talk about disinformation? And this is gonna be the theme of our talk is that we need words. So Clue or Cluedo, the game, we basically went round and round on how do we talk about this? And it's like, well, who's involved, where and how? Except in this game, it doesn't just have to be uh, Mrs. Plum. Mrs. It's Mrs. Plum and it could be more than one. What, Professor Mustard, Colonel, there, Mustard. Colonel Mustard, right? It could be more places, it could be more persons than just one. So that's what we looked at. Okay, so now we just sort of cuddle up on the- Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, okay. I okay. didn't have to switch sides, no, but you know. Okay. We're, we're good. Um, do you want to start with this? So this is now, that that's Fisky. Now we're false, all right? We all good? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. So so you, you get to stay with me. It's going to just go back a few thousand years ago. And I've been looking at, you know, well, what was pre-fall of Rome? What was happening before the fall of Rome that, that led up to this? And if you look at that, there is a Latin term that is that was used, but it basically means we gentlemen's agreements. It's the assumption that you have of the way that a society works that are not codified, but are expected. And what happened pre-fall of Rome was that certain rulers came in and started ignoring those, breaking those. It's a sounding familiar for 2000 years later, right? That was going on. This is Nero, by the way. And I loved Danny going, Nero is fiddling, right? We're seeing this. And this is, you know, the crumbling of knowledge. And I put the Colosseum, and I probably should have put the Library of Alexandria. But one of the things that I always like to think about is knowledge is under attack, okay? And in during the fall of Rome, that was one of the things that was attacked. Knowledge, science, trust in it, what was going on. And we're about to see that years later. So during World War II, 1942, uh, Robert Merton is a very, very uh, fundamental kind of uh, thinker in the whole concept of sociology of science. He's got, his writings are incredible. And what he wrote about in this particular one was about the incipient and actual attacks upon the integrity of science. And he's talking about that that means scientists are recognising particular types of social structure that aren't working anymore. Um, and he was sort of saying that he was sort of like dismissing the idea of manifestos and pronouncements by associations. And his comment is an institution under attack must reimagine its foundations, restate its objectives and seek out its rationale. At the same time, he came up with as part of this, the idea of the Mertonian norms. He didn't call them the Mertonian norms, but he called them the norms of science. And there are four of them. The universalism idea is that the validity of the science is independent of the socio-political status and personal attributes of its participants. It was World War II. There was a lot of, a lot of instability going on in the world, clearly. And right now, there's a lot of instability going on in the world. The second one was originally called communism. He had to change the name because of the political <laughs> interpretations of communism. So it became communalism. And the idea that all scientists should have common ownership of scientific goods, intellectual property, to promote collective collaboration, and that secrecy is the opposite of this norm. Open access, anyone? Disinterestedness is the idea that scientific institutions and individuals, for that matter, act for the benefit of a common scientific enterprise rather than for the personal gain of individuals within them. And if we think about how research is assessed, and the drivers that pushes towards the way institutions operate to try and push themselves up university rankings, the way the kind of uh, authorship for sale and citation for sale that is highly driven by the research assessment kind of uh, structures we currently have in place. It goes against disinterestedness. And then organised scepticism. So the term peer review only came to, to light in the 70s. This was 1942. He's talking about peer review. He's talking, saying that scientific claims should be exposed to critical scrutiny before being accepted in methodology and institutional codes of conduct. And 
all of our conversations that we tend to have in this space, fundamentally, whether we realize or not, come back to these norms. So it's really important to understand that's where we sort of started when we started talking about this sort of stuff. So we've gone from Rome to <laughs> World War II to now. now. Should we talk about trust? Let's talk about trust. So one of the things about words is they can have multiple meanings. And we talk about trust a lot, but I want to make sure that we talk about trust in the and separate out the two ways of trust. The first is reliability. If you see Jardina, that's the cat down there, she trusted that I would feed her every day. That's a reliability. But would she let me pet her? This is a stray cat, by the way, not a, not a, right? That is a very different level of trust. You can rely on someone to do a transactional thing without trusting their moral integrity or their moral standing. This was when she decided to come in and she wanted pets and food, by the way. That was so both the reliability and the moral standing. But I want to make sure, just as an example, that trust can trust as other words can be taken different ways. And we're yep. going to explore that. So trust is a word that's being used in multiple ways. And uh, so we're talking about weaponization of language. And so here we are, uh, general impact factors, you know, and I don't know what people's individual thoughts are on general impact factors. Mine are, can we just move on, please? Um, and But this is the, the, the most recent citation reports. And it's really quite interesting that the number of times the word trust has come in. To, it's, it's, it's a recent uh, a recent insertion into this sort of language. If you look back over the sort of discussion about from uh, the general citation reports of uh, descriptions of themselves, the word trust is new and it's there a few times. They're talking about the pressing need for the indicators of trustworthiness at the journal level. We are, you turn to us because we will show you what is trustworthy. Um, they're talking about both scholarly impact and trustworthiness across all disciplines and our commitment to enhancing transparency and trust continues. So thanks, Jif. We love you. What would we do without you? So it's just really interesting how these words are starting to be co-opted into the language, particularly of, of the commercial offerings. So that's one example. I think this goes into the next, but the weaponization of language. So this part I did write down and it is going to sound less like a discussion and more like <laughs> like you know. So Epicurus believed in atoms as the smallest element of life. They are indivisible and unchangeable, moving quick as the speed of thought. But what if the newest technology exists to move faster than the speed of thought? And now past the dawn of astounding enlightenment and the information age, the age of artificial intelligence has been a ploy to confound human thoughts. How do we use our full senses to make sound decisions and differentiate between what doesn't sit right because it's wrong and what doesn't sit right because we have not adapted to something new or something makes us uncomfortable or we can't find the words? James Carroll said, we swim in language, we think in language, we live in language. And years later, Michiku Kakutani said, and this is why authoritarian regimes throughout history have co-opted everyday language in an effort to control not just how people communicate, but also how they think. To understand how to trust science, we need to understand what it means to be manipulated. What would we have expected? And what can we do about it? Because understanding matters and words matter. And so, we find ourselves in George Orwell's 1984, uh, where he talks about Newspeak. Now, I don't know how many people have read 1984 and how many people have read 1984 in the last 10 years? Okay, because I reread it. I read it at school and then I reread it only a couple of years ago. And, and man, it was depressing. <laughs> it's just, I was thinking, I'm not sure this is very good for my mental health. But anyway, the idea of news speak and that, that, that words can be uh, substituted and substituting one word for another and interchangeable. Um, and also the, the, that we can uh, 
use words in different ways that we can, from a grammatical point of view, uh, so they can be used as a noun, verb, adjective or adverb. Mind you, we do this all the time. There's a fabulous book called um, Learn to Write Badly, How to Succeed in the Social Sciences. Um, and he talks about the nominalization of verbs uh, and that, that this, is a, this is a mechanism that's used by disciplines to put a fence around your discipline. And so you use particular words in a particular way to say this is our boundary stamping. And to be honest, this is a bit of a problem that we've had for both scholarly communication and your area. Um, say it again. Forensic, forensic science forensic science metrics yeah. i'm like wait a minute which yeah. word yeah that okay <laughs> so the, these are areas of of research and work and and cameron and i've had this conversation before about how do we make this a discipline because it's it, it, in the academic space you often are talking to real academics who go oh what would you know and you think well a lot more than you actually how about you listen to what i'm saying and the problem is we do stuff right we write articles and publish them and we have conferences and talk we do all the stuff that academics do it's not seen as a discipline and one of the reasons that our scholarly communication is not seen as a discipline is because we use words that everybody else uses like publishing what do we mean when we talk about publishing and when and I, I remember having arguments at my in my work my first job at Australian National University with the um, DVC of research and he was saying well publishing just means something, making something available I said, well, that's a dictionary definition of it. But when we're talking about scholarly publishing, that means something quite different. There's a whole lot of stuff that sits around there. And I'm talking about that bit. So because we're using words that are the vernacular words and we don't nominalise them, because we actually speak in a language that maybe you might be able to understand, this then is not an academic discipline. And that's a bit of a problem. And we're going to talk about some of those words, you know, as we continue. We're flying on time. I think that's yours. Oh, this is me again. Okay, so language appropriation. Um, so the uh, up here is a discussion list on a, a, a called Open Cafe, and there was a particular person who was sort of got quite cross because they were saying, um, "I can't read that's too tall." Um, whether you think we're whether you think we're going the right way depends on your perspective, kind of thing. And then she said, "Lately, it seems like some people are just moving the goalposts." And she was all upset about people moving the goalposts at that, you know, that, that somehow the open access movement keeps changing their mind about what they want. We've sorted it out, just stop. And that was where she was at. And I'm thinking, hmm, let's have a conversation about changing goalposts. And, you know, that, that comes into the consolidation stuff that I was talking about before. But also this question about appropriation of language. So back in the day, somebody, and please, that person really should never have lived. But anyway, we came up with this idea of green and gold as explanations for different parts of open access. These things are nonsensical. They don't relate to anything, majorly problematic for multiple reasons. So at that time, green open access meant put a copy in a repository. A secondary open access might be a better way of describing it. So something that's published, then put a version of it and make it available. That's what green is at the time. Gold open access may, meant born open access. It's published open access. And there are two different ways you could make that happen. You could publish in a fully open access journal like the um, Biomed Central or PLOS journals, or you could make a copy, uh, you could make pay, or, sorry, or you could yeah, have the opportunity to pay some money to a commercial uh, publisher to make your version, your work open access in amongst a subscription, otherwise subscription journal hybrid. But the language started getting getting co-opted into gold means pay to publish. And of course, gold is the best. Gold means money, right? So there's a there's associations with the word gold. And 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 that 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 fight was won. And so we had to come up with another word like diamond. So now we've got diamond open access journals, and diamonds are better than gold, right? They're fancier. So that's a bit of a problem. So, so, so here we go, two, two examples over there with the colorful ones just over there that um, are examples on web pages of institutions to try and explain the different colors and what they sort of mean. They're both quite complicated because like th these are not good visualizations. So just because it's just because it's a picture and it's got colors doesn't mean it's good, by the way. Like the visualizations need to actually be good. And right in the top corner there is um, some work that Cameron's crowd that has looked at um, a publication over time in, in different countries. And there's a sort of a bit of a debate going on. And I think I'll have to... Uh, 
one, I realised that people call this green open access. To me, it's a gold open access. So I've got going back to here. While some people call this green open access, to me, it's a gold open access article. You're entitled to your opinion. All right. So it's all about opinions. None of this is real because this is not a discipline. This is just, you know, it's all up for debate. Um, and so then the diamond thing. Now, the problem with the diamond journals, as we mentioned just before, is they're starting to get organised. We're not talking about just people just, you know, um, chucking up an OJS instance of OJS and making a, you know, a journal and things and they say, oh, that's just that OJS stuff. That doesn't really matter. People are getting consolidating around this. Germany's putting some money behind it. There's all sorts of principles around diamond open access publishing. It's starting to look like a thing. So we've got to do something about this language. We've got to, we've got that diamond, that be, that's better than gold. So now this new term down the bottom is diamond journals or sponsored journals. Sponsored journals. They're risky. They're not trustworthy. They're not sustainable. Risk, trust, sustainable. These words are being weaponized in this discussion by the commercial operators to really undermine what's happening in the open space. It comes up all the time. Once your eyes are open to it, you see it everywhere. So I'm going to reflect on that for yes. just a second from two different perspectives. One from the researcher who was con very confused, right? And still am. I still call up Cynthia and go, how are we going to publish, you know, the article? So Cynthia and I, Cynthia was supposed to be here. And, and I was like, I don't know. This is your domain. I don't know. And, you know, the question that I always had is, well, what does it mean for me? I don't want to be told what it does, but what does it do for me and possibly in the future? And some of those future consequences, we don't necessarily know, right? Because who knew that putting things open would then be swiped up and people could ignore copyright and then make a lot of profit off of them using large language models, right? So some of the things we can't predict. But the other thing, not the other thing, the other thing, um, that I want to come from the perspective of the extrinsic is this word sponsored, right? Because it really does resonate for me who works on conflicts of interest and understands how we define these conflicts of interest. So it's very confusing to look at, well, this, I don't, I don't want to be part of sponsored if I am part of this publication. So then I get more confused and then Cynthia gets another call. But you know that's where it's actually very important for the library community to help us understand what these mean for us and clarify what the potential consequences or unintended consequences are. So speaking of that, this week, a couple of days ago, um, you know, I'm sort of out of whack time-wise with my colleagues in Australia, but there's been a big discussion. At least one university in Australia is thinking about shutting its theses back down because of the AI scraping. So we're going backwards. Risk. Risk. I think you start on from an intrinsic standpoint, and I'm going to then talk about risk from an extrinsic standpoint. Okay, so this is uh, this refers to an article that happened uh, in the Times Higher Education, not Times Higher Education, what am I talking about? Um, no, it was Times Higher Education, but it was, um, yeah, but it, she also wrote about it in, in, in another uh, area. So the argument that was being put forward in this article was that because the British Library had been the subject of a cyber attack, what we need to do is we can't risk having all of these little repositories around in different universities. What we need to do is just have one repository and it should be looked after by a commercial operator because that's safer. And it was a really sort of weird perspective. And uh, and so David Prosser uh, sort of did a, went, went to it before the bin fire, um, did a, uh, a sort of like analysis of what the, what the article was about. And I made a comment about it's part of a broader narrative currently that open infrastructure is less sustainable. And that narrative comes from commercial entities who must be, uh, who must be worried. Uh, note that these entities are only sustainable because of enormous amounts of taxpayer money that goes to them. I think, you know, how sustainable would, would all these open infrastructures be if we were giving them billions of dollars? Her response was, um, I can see why you might think that, but as somebody who has the responsibility of all IT, sustainability, there's that word again, and cyber defence in institutions, I'm afraid what uh, that is what is driving this. It's a pure risk-based calculation. 
Now, from my point of view, in a university, what I see as risky is the fact that we now have very few options for ownership of the infrastructure that we have to buy to, to run our systems. To me, that's really risky. So we've got a situation where I worked for an organisation uh, at university where they were kind of part of the development group for Ex Libris's product called Esploro, which is a uh, you know researcher sort of profile kind of product. And so we got a discount on our licence so that we, and then we had a staff member who was sort of working with the company to try and develop it. I came in sort of, you know, after, actually, as it turned out, once I started investigating after that agreement had finished, um, but started doing a bit of a time of motion study about how much time is my, my, my staff member spending on this, how much is she being paid, and how much you know, benefit did we get like in terms of discount. And the, the proportions were we were putting in 10 times more than we were, we were getting out of it. So there was an interest in us, in us doing this. You know, There's a bit of risk in there in that I actually could have been doing other stuff because it's a very talented staff member. Um, but that bit's not so much the risk. What happens is Clarivate buys Ex Libris, right? And then I have a conversation with Mr. Clarivate on the phone and he says, oh, we've got seven products in that kind of area. So there's no guarantee at all that Esploro will continue on. Clarivate at one, some stage is going to consolidate and say, why are we running seven products that do the same thing? How about we go down to the two most successful ones? Esploro may or may not be that. And if it's not, all of that investment is gone from the university's point of view. That's risk for me. Well, I think that's what's important about when when she says it is a pure risk-based calculation. What risk is she talking about? Is she talking about financial risk? Is she talking about legal risk? Is she talking about their corporate risk, right? And you're talking about other types of risks. We have the individual risks. We have the risks to our future and that future knowledge that we also have. So it's it's used as a weapon right here in order to shut a conversation down. So good for you for engaging. Thank you. Um, and this is, uh, he's a different version of risk. So this is something that Elsevier has um, uh, published as their, you know, it's a public company, so they publish their reports and so on. And what they, they flag is that the payment model in scholarly publishing remains a risk for the company. So it's like, well, <laughs> Okay, which way do you want to run this risk? How, how, like, what's risky here? It's just being used in these multiple different ways and it's being thrown out. So just have a look, just keep your eyes open. Risk, trust, sustainability. And just as a personal reflection, I think it's interesting. So I was at a university and felt like what I wanted to do, I could not do there, which is how I ended up at as she says, the dark side at a for-profit company, but I am now able to do more thinking about this. So there's risk of what you talked about in the very beginning of losing those academics who are moving out onto other things if you don't have an environment in which they can work. Okay, so let's talk about extrinsic risk because I, uh, I was sitting in Danny's class and this is interesting for me, you know, going, yeah, but, but, you know, how much are we going to complain about publishers and how much are we going to complain about open at, you know, the tax on open access and things, nothing against you personally, this is just what's going through my mind. And because here's some of what I've experienced, um, Cynthia and I wrote an article called safeguarding scientific integrity, a case study and examining manipulation in the peer review process. We absolutely believe that we have to codify these systems of trust that we have, and we have to understand things like peer review into, in order to understand how it may or may not work or how it may or may not be manipulated. So that's why we wrote this article. I will tell you it was a special issue, but they're not called special issues in Frontiers. They're called something else that in Frontiers, and we had used that because they were they showed who the editors were and who the peer reviewers were. So in that sense, it was open and it allowed us to do this analysis. And this analysis was in a very hot topic. Um, the topic had to do with people with conflicts of interest between the editors, the, the guest editors, the peer reviewers and the authors who are all aligned ideologically on 
uh, anti-abortion or pro-life, however you want to say it. So we made recommendations because we use that as an example, but what our paper really is about is about conflicts of interest between these. How do we codify it? How do we look for these? And our recommendation was to open peer review because whatever people say or don't see about frontiers, that actually was really nice to be able to see those peer reviewers. We suggested a conflicts of interest database. Again, you know, tell us, no, that's not a good idea. Let's debate it, but let's, you know, that was one of our suggestions. And then the other one was to take responsibility. Publishers need to, institutions where people are at, guest editors need to take responsibility. This was what was picked up in the news. Okay, what we said, what we were going after has been weaponized. And what I see when I look at the weaponization of science is that there's a lot of criticism of peer review, rightfully so. We have a problem with peer review within the scientific community. But if we think about trying to knock at and chip at the cracks of trust in science, that is one of the places that is being targeted. And we were able to see it firsthand. So how do we balance the fact of needing these publications, which are gold, needing peer review, which from an external extrinsic standpoint is, is still gold with the problems that we're facing within science. Okay, so we're now gonna move into the sort of uh, the global part. So we've talked about trust. I don't, do, I don't even think we get onto all that jazz, to be honest. So sorry, that was, that was, that was false advertising. <laughs> <laughs> so this fits, the, this fits the global part. So um, I, I, I'm Australian and um, most of my career initially was in Australia and, you know, everything's a long way away. One advantage about being in Australia is you are ahead. So whenever there's a deadline for submissions for a conference, you've always got an extra day. Um, so that's always a, an advantage. But the, um, the interesting thing I found, because at that stage there were no online anything, so you just you just you either had to fly or you just missed out. So you just missed out. So then I go and work at Cambridge and you're in, in Greenwich Mean Time over there, you're the centre. So it works for everything. And so everything's in your time. It's fabulous. It's during your work day, you can go to events, who knew? Um, so that was great fun. And then the, um, and you could sort of see during the day if you published something that, oh, the Americans are waking up, you know, cause suddenly all the commentary starts coming through on Twitter and all this sort of stuff. It's quite, and, and you can see that, you know, there's the sun coming across the country um, about where people are waking up. Then we moved back to Australia in 2019 and suddenly I'm a long way away. I'm still on a lot of committees, so I'm up a lot in the middle of the night. You know, there's quite often you know, sort of sessions at like one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, you sort of debate, do I go to sleep? If it's like 11 o'clock, do I go to sleep for a couple of hours and get up and that sort of stuff. And I have to say, Americans, you guys do not understand time zones. Like you go, <laughs> oh, oh, but I can't have it at that time because that's seven o'clock in the morning for me. Thinking, it's three o'clock for me right now. <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, so it's a real problem. And uh, and so, and then sort of, so it was really challenging and I couldn't get to any of the conferences because I was living in, in, in Australia and then COVID happened. Suddenly everything went online and it's like, hello, you guys, join me on the couch. Um, and so it was great because suddenly I could, uh, in the middle of the night, attend things. Something, please, 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 can you actually put your time zones when you advertise an event? You say 3 p.m. When? Okay, it's a globe, all right? It's not flat. And so one example of this was when Twitter was Twitter, um, was uh, this woman had, random woman had tweeted, I'm quite excited about, you know, some, some artist's uh, album coming out, you know, looking forward to buying it, something like that. And then there was a comment back going, gee, you must be a real fan to be tweeting about this at five o'clock in the morning. And she wrote back and said, I'm in the UK, question mark. And the response was, 5 a.m. is 5 a.m. So there you go, <laughs> just in one go. Um, but the, the problem also that I have and, and that, that, that exchange with Mark over this sort of concept of that open research infrastructure it, it happened over a few days um, because when I'm commenting, he's asleep and when he's commenting, I'm asleep. And so it sort of takes, these things take a really long time. In the open cafe conversation, which was one about the, you know, keep, you keep moving the goalposts, conversations happen very quickly there. So by the time I wake up, it's finished. Everyone's moved on. And so I'm missing out on these conversations. All right. So we've got a bit of a problem about speed. So the other thing, though, is we're really looking around the globe this way. 
right? And by the way, I, I do visually flatten the earth to understand time zones because my sister lives in Hawaii and I work with people <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what in the world time zone am I on? But we haven't looked, except for Australia. I mean, what about South America? What about Africa? These are on the same time zones and yet where's the conversation going? Where has it been? I have, I did figure out, not that, you know, Twitter being musky now, I just don't deal well with it. But if you put a few things in another language, if you translate it to Spanish, then all of a sudden you start getting other things in that language and you, I could start getting um, connected to science, Twitter, South America, Latin America, and that was a lot of fun. And it's very easy if you don't speak the language just to translate it to this point. But we need to also just acknowledge what you, you know, we can complain about time zones this way, but look up and down as well. Um, the other thing that I wanna bring in on globalization, and I don't think, I'm not sure we have another picture or anything for it, is um, what's happening with the ever shrinking globalization of the world. Meaning we're in the US, there is very much a country that is not liked right now by the, the US from a global competitor, whatnot, but, and, and that's on the global, you know, sphere. But do we just go back to our siloed self? I mean, what do I stop? You know, my my flatmate in London is from Hong Kong. Are we not supposed to talk to any each other anymore? You know, are we not supposed to work with any, each other? And I don't have an answer for this, but I'm saying it's something that we have to think about moving forward, that a lot of us really are connected at this point individually. We have friends around the globe. We know people around the globe. And how is that going to work? when our governments decide to operate differently than how we individually feel. Now, in some countries, that's not a big surprise because they have operated very individually and different from their, from their government. It is a big deal in the United States and it's a different way of thinking about things. Again, I just think more as a provocative question, what are we gonna do about that? Yeah. And then we move to post X or post Twitter. Um, this is a photo from Denmark um, and uh, it was Amsterdam, actually, Amsterdam. Could where they either one. Yeah, <laughs> where they'd just been fished out. Um, and so, you know, Twitter was such a, an amazing thing. It was so cool. Like, and you could put out questions and go, oh, I'm wondering, does anybody know the reference for this or got any suggestions for? Or what do people think about? And you could have a conversation that wasn't, it's 5 a.m. It's 5 a.m. And that's, that's, you know, that was then. That was when things were nice, but they're not nice anymore. So, okay, Twitter's out the door. What are we using? How are we having these conversations? I'm kind of using LinkedIn, but LinkedIn's a lot of kind of, there's what we call that uh, virtue signaling. Like my husband really gets really annoyed. He works in the school space. And he said, oh, he said, what happens at the beginning of each holiday is, you know, aspiring or just new to, be, new to being principals will do, they'll have a photograph of a stack of books on a beach, like workbooks, you know, books about good leadership and this sort of stuff and looking forward to my holiday reading and all this. And it's real virtue signaling about, look what a good leader I am and all this rubbish. So there's a lot of that that goes on in LinkedIn. Um, but generally people are nicer to each other. They don't tend not to rant on about whatever weird thing they want to rant on about because it's kind of work environment. But you don't get the discussions, I feel, that that you we used to have in Twitter. So where are those conversations occurring? How are we doing this on a global scale? Or are we starting to sort of disintegrate back into our little silos? And I can just talk to people in my time zone, I suppose. You know, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I am part of a group that has gone elsewhere to discuss things. So what used to be more open is now more hidden. And that's, and we're using different tools. And that's the way that we're, you know, we've decided, I'm sure there's other people who've moved that way as well. But the question is, right, what, what do we do? How do we foster that sort of collaboration? And how do we build something better than what was before? Because Twitter was great and it was also awful at the same time. And I mean, but I learned more about things like lizards that I had no idea that I was interested in, right? Because I just was following somebody on Twitter and yet also is, you know, helping destroy democracy. So, you know, that, right. So where do we go? So this brings us back to Merton, really. And um, 
and this is sort of our uh, penultimate slide, um, which is sort of how do these things now resonate? You know, it's not 1942, it's 2024. So how do we feel about the concept of scientific validity independent of the socio-political status or personal attributes of its participants when they happen to be from a country that we don't like apparently at the moment? So what do we do then? Uh, all scientists should have common ownership of scientific goods, intellectual property. Now, this is before we had the idea of signing away the, the right, your rights to your work, that you could still have the moral rights to the work, but not any ability to make any money out of them. And that's what we do now. So uh, how's communalism working? Uh, disinterestedness. Well, we've already talked about that's just not working at all. And uh, peer review. Well, you can buy peer reviews and we know that there's all sorts of problems with peer reviews. So this is kind of... this suggestion that this is how research should be working is now not really holding and so we need to kind of start again like let's have this conversation again what does it look like for now because that was 1942 and it worked well for a long time but it's it doesn't work anymore because we can't pretend that everyone's a good chap good oh uh so we've got that's probably where we want to um, open the floor for conversation. But the thing is that the, the, the theme that came through in both of our, our uh, talks was who's responsible? And the answer is everyone and no one. So be someone. Right, that's our message to you. And now we'd like to open the floor to any questions. Good job, Nathan. So there's a microphone there that you can use. Just turn it on when you go up, and um, I can bring this one over. The mic's for the purposes of the recording. So yes, we so we can the room at the hear room you on the recording. Oh, you're about to say the, the purpose for asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> Just somebody. Oh, we have somebody. <laughs> Sorry, I need more tea. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like there's... Uh, huge numbers of questions I could ask, but just to start with one thing that's very specific. Um, over the last year, I've become the ethics chair for the IEEE Computer Society, and so we're seeing lots of interesting things, and I feel like I'm spending a huge amount of time trying to investigate lots of interesting behavior. And when we do this, we keep a list of authors who have engaged in bad behavior, and it's an internal list. And then we don't have any idea if they're doing the same thing with other publishers. and. And so I guess uh, my question is, is there, is there some way that multiple publishers, both commercial as well as non-commercial, could work together? And how could you, I, I don't know, this leads to lots of questions about openness and privacy and correctness and, and all sorts of things. But I'm just wondering if there's been any thoughts about how to, how to do this more globally. I can tell you one initiative that you may or may not know about, the STM Integrity Hub which you may or may not agree with the way that, that they're doing, but it is bringing publishers together so that all the submissions go through that so that they can check the, the authors. I will tell you that the problem that you're facing is the problem that a lot of people are facing. One of the things that we're doing in, we're, and it's a foci community, just to let you know, because we don't wanna say forensic scientometrics because you know you have to shorten things. The foci community, is to um, compare notes, but legally it starts, th this is where something like GDPR starts coming in and privacy um, limits what we can do. So I know there are some of us who are working on it and what to do, but legally that brings in a problem. So I, I hate to say we're working on it and we don't have a solution, but we're working on it and we don't have a solution. But we also get together and, and you know, people see certain things when they get together. That shouldn't have been recorded, but there you go. Thank you. Okay, sorry, my usual problem with height, but let's see how this works. Uh, great, Tino, thank you so much. I guess the comment this last question I had for you um, is that you've talked a lot about the current journal system and the current peer review model. And I used to work in publishing for many years and then I've worked in other areas. And over time, I think for me, one of the things that I became convinced about is that the current, at least for, for example, the peer review system as it is currently is not scalable. 
we are publishing more papers than ever before. I think that's a good thing for, for the record. I believe that open outputs should be published and connected. So that's not a bad thing, but how do you scale something that relies on attention to detail and human time and scale it 10 times to have many more outputs out there? I Personally, I am very skeptical about the opportunity or capability that we have to scale this. And I guess my question is to you, should we not rethink that whole system? I mean, you've talked about the signals of trust, but we may need different signals of trust for different papers, data, preprints, whatever it is. So I don't think that everything needs to be peer reviewed, but what does the alternative look like? So the, you know, all metrics of trust, so to speak. So I, my, I guess I would be interested in your thoughts as to, do you think this is scalable? And is not, if not, what are the alternatives that we have? I think this is a really interesting question. And, and look, in some ways, you sort of think about wars and the idea about with a war, why don't we send in the drones and then maybe the robots should all just fight each other and then, you know, they're just the war can happen over there. And it's a bit like this with AI. You can have, you know, generated papers that are peer-reviewed by AI that are published, you know, like it's sort of like that's happening over there. So maybe like one of the reasons why we have lots and lots of papers being published and more and more papers being published is not necessarily that more and more research is being done. It's because that's the thing that actually counts for you getting promoted and so on so clearly us actually addressing the way we assess researchers is pretty important um so if we were to actually say let's actually perhaps have a two-tier system so lot, there's a lot of information that maybe doesn't need to be peer-reviewed but this bit does maybe we need to actually focus it because we're kind of we've said oh this is sort of works it works when we have sort of this big it's not working now so maybe we just still keep it that big and this is this is fine it's okay. It's not that bad. Maybe we want to do something like that. But that's why we have to readdress the Newtonian norms because that's for when it was this big and it's not this big anymore. So it's not really an answer. I don't know if you've got a... I just want to make sure. Um, thanks so much for a really interesting keynote. I'm Erin Robinson, Metadata Game Changers. And I think one of the questions I have for all of, for both of you is around trust and how science is changing rapidly. And one of the things that I noticed with COVID research, for instance, is how things were changing and the way that that was communicated to the public seemed to be a place where we saw trust falling apart. And I guess I wonder if that's something that you're considering with trust and risk and weaponization of language. So yes, definitely. So in my, my terrible river image that was obviously generated, right? If that goes into the ocean of knowledge, then we have the brackish water. And that's where I think that scholarly communication is and needs to focus on, just like we have scientists who focus on studying the, the ecosystem of that. I Thank you, Natalie, for laughing. <laughs> okay, um, That's where we need to have it. I mean, back to scholarly communication isn't even recognized, right? Those are the people who, I say those are the people, whoever the people are, that is the area, right, that we need to focus on and call out that it is a discipline and it is worthy and needed because absolutely that communication, that, that brackish area is absolutely vital in protecting science and protecting the, the junk from getting out. I'm getting very much the... <laughs> <laughs> the hook. Um, so um, we're really pleased. And obviously there's some people who still want to ask questions, but that's why we're here, guys. We're here for the conference for these conversations. So we're really pleased that we've started this conversation. I'm here all week. Um, you're leaving at some point today, um, but I'm really happy to open the conversations. We've got lots of coffee and tea and drinks and dinners and all sorts of things. So let's have the conversation there. So thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Leslie.